Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 5 Hope Mom Mom and Harry moved back into Woodcrest. My family wasn't one that talked about things. I was never privy to what she and daddy -o had decided. I didn't ask, they didn't tell. But whatever it was, he never put his hands on her again. It was midway through my senior year. I had just gotten my SAT scores, low 1200s. This was far from a perfect score, but for a black kid from an inner city school in Philadelphia, those numbers were more than good enough to get me really good options for college. Mom Mom was ecstatic. She was dancing around the house, calling all her friends at Carnegie Mellon and MIT. You would have thought she was going back to college. My strong subjects were math and science. By 1986, more and more schools were beginning to offer computer science and engineering courses. Mom Mom set up a war room. She had a map of the United States. She was cross-referencing engineering schools with cities and states where we had family members, costs of living with distance from Philadelphia. With that information at hand, she narrowed down my options to her top five or six schools organized in order of most likely to least likely acceptance. She then filled out all of the applications, handled all of the housing logistics, and weighed all of the travel and financial aid issues. At the time, she worked for the school board of Philadelphia, so when it came to education, her organization and execution made even Daddio applaud. We had family friends in Wisconsin, and suddenly Mom Mom decided we were going to take a quick family trip to see them. The patriarch, Walter McCallum, we call him Uncle Witch McCallit, was tight with the admissions officer at the University College of Engineering. She had already gotten my sister Pam into Hampton University, and I was up next. Her wildest dreams as a parent were coming true. All of her kids were going to college. Mom Mom was the commander in charge of the Will Getting Into College mission. All of a sudden, she was very comfortable with the idea that if two people are in charge, everybody dies. It was a Friday night, and my girl Judy Stewart was having her birthday party up the block. I met up with Reddy Rock after school. Yo, you going to Judy's party tonight? He said. Nah, man, she played me. I DJed her party for the last two years, and she got somebody else and didn't even tell me. Well, she didn't just get somebody else, man. She got Jazzy Jeff. Word? I've been hearing about him, but I never saw him cut. Yeah, man, he's ill, Reddy said. He's from Southwest, though, and he's gonna be in our hood. We gonna stand for that? Reddy Rock always knew how to gas me up for a battle. Not that I needed much fuel. Yo, what's his rapper's name? I said. MC Ice. He can't touch you, though. Nobody can touch me. Reddy Rock loved when I talked dirty like that. He gave me a pound. My mind was churning with battle rhymes organizing themselves for tonight's slaughter. You know what? We're gonna hit that party tonight and smash these fools, I said. We gonna rep Winefield. Bet, he said. Ready Rock C and the Fresh Prince versus Jazzy Jeff and MC Ice. I'll meet you there at 8. I bet. Later. Jeffrey Allen Towns grew up on Rodman Street in southwest Philly, about four or five miles from Winefield. Jeff came from a musical family. His father used to MC for the jazz legend Count Basie. His older brothers played in funk and fusion bands, and his sisters were always singing Motown tunes. He was the baby of the family and was a musical sponge, 
absorbing and processing all of the incredible talent that was happening around him. At the age of 15, Jeff was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. After various painful and difficult treatments, he managed to beat the illness, but his mother became understandably overprotective, and Jeff found himself spending his days in the family basement, surrounded by 10,000 of his father's and brother's jazz, funk, and blues records. Jeff would spend all day digging through them, listening to everything from John Coltrane and Charlie Mingus to Stevie Wonder and James Brown, noting the different styles, the musicianship, the instrumentation. When he was 10, Jeff had begun DJing. His encyclopedic knowledge made him a musical marvel. Everyone called him Jazz because of his ability to seamlessly blend complex jazz tunes with modern funk, disco, or hip-hop rhythms. Eventually, that got extended to Jazzy Jeff. A lot of you young guns might not know this, but back in the day, DJs were actually more famous than MCs. Rapping was still pretty rudimentary. We hadn't developed the rhythmic or linguistic ingenuity that we have today. Instead, DJing was the innovative and exciting center of attention. It's hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with old school cutting, but Jeff's ability to scratch out rhythms and blend sounds was, and still is, for the most part, unparalleled. He pioneered techniques and styles in those Philly basement parties as a teenager that are still used by thousands of DJs all over the world today. He could manipulate records in ways that no one had seen or heard before. He could bend keys and time signatures and alter sounds, one of which I later named the Transformer Scratch because it reminded me of the sound effect from the Transformers cartoon. He could make the vocal lines of two records talk back and forth to each other, creating conversations from two completely different songs. I could go on and on, but I'll stop and just say there's a reason why many, including myself, consider Jeff to be the GOAT of hip-hop DJ. Even today, over 30 years later, he's revered by DJing experts as one of the best in the world. The point is... I know I'm the big famous movie guy, but back in the 80s, Jazzy Jeff was the star. It was me backing him up. That night at Judy's, I showed up early. I made my entrance into her basement. Two-tone lean jeans, black on the back, white on the front, with fresh prints down the left leg in red letters and a matching two-tone lead jacket. I had taken the lead patch off the race band of the pants and had attached it to a silver rope chain around my neck. I was almost too fly for this party. As I stepped into the room, my mind flashed to the last time I had been in Judy's basement. The harrowing events documented in my first single, Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, actually happened right here. I was with one of Judy's girlfriends in that basement one night when Judy's father woke up at around 2 a.m. to the unmistakable sounds of exquisite lovemaking. My sounds, not hers. From the top floor, I heard him bellowing and tearing down the stairs. Who the is in my house? I bolted up and scrambled naked through the narrow back hall, snatching open the door to the rear driveway, which to my horror had since disappeared under 12 inches of snow. It was 31 degrees, and I had a choice to make. Where is he? Where is he? Judy's father roared. Decision made. I ran a full city block, buck naked, back to my house in the snow. I was outside for over 10 minutes making snowballs, trying to hit Harry's bedroom window. Finally, the window goes up, and Harry looks down. I had not heard my brother laugh harder before or since. It also happens that Judy's basement was where I met Jeff for the first time. Whatever magic Juju Judy had going on in her basement in the mid 80s, apparently Jeff and I owe our careers to it. Thanks Judy. When I arrived, Jeff was still setting up. 
Judy introduced us. What up, man? I'm Jazz, he said. Prince, I said, pointing to my leg. I was thinking, this is Jazzy Jeff? He was wearing these big <coughs> glasses, and he didn't have his name on his clothes anywhere. How was anybody supposed to know he was Jazzy Jeff? There was a band-aid around the middle scratching finger on his left hand. Apparently, he'd been scratching so much that the top knuckle of his finger now had a bend in it. Everybody was raving about this dude, but I was thoroughly unimpressed. If this joke is the best DJ in the city, I'm sad for Philly. A lot of the famous DJs back in those days were flashy, doing backflips and jumping all over their turntables and all of that. Jeff was quiet, skinny, soft-spoken, and looked more like a science nerd than a samurai on the wheels of steel. I sat down and chilled while Jeff continued to set up. It's always good to show up early before a battle so you can clock your material. I was plotting all the punchlines I was going to kick about his glasses and his band-aid, but I was really going to be battling ice. A few minutes go by and I say, Yo Jazz, where's ice? Jeff didn't even look up. I could tell this was a sore subject. Good question. I called him like five minutes. He never hit me back. Back then, there were no cell phones. You couldn't get in touch with people like today. Judy's guests were arriving now, but there was no sign of Ready Rock. The party was starting. I could see that Judy was getting nervous, and I could sense that Jeff wasn't feeling too great either. My pleaser kicked in. Full steam. Hey, I'll rock with you till Ice gets here if you want, I said. Jeff, relieved, said, Oh, that would be dope. Thanks. I hate having to talk on the mic. I got you, I said. There's nothing I enjoy more than talking on a mic. We both laughed. Judy squealed and clapped her hands. There are rare moments as an artist that you cannot quantify or measure. As much as you try, you can rarely reproduce them, and it's nearly impossible to describe them. But every artist knows what I'm talking about. Those moments of divine inspiration where creativity flows out of you so brilliantly and effortlessly that somehow you are better than you have ever been before. That night with Jeff was the first time I ever tasted it. The place that athletes call the zone. It felt like we already existed as a group and we just had to catch up to ourselves. Natural comfortable home Jeff could sense my rhyme style he always knew when my jokes were coming when to drop the track out so people could clearly hear the punchline and I could tell by which hand he was using what type of scratch was coming he preferred different scratches with his left hand than with his right sensing this I could draw the audience's attention to which scratch was coming by which hand he was transitioning to. He was choosing the tracks and adjusting the tempos based on what he felt best accentuated the narrative structure and the flow of my rhymes. And just as the music crescendoed, I'd throw down a dagger of a line and Jeff would drop the beat into the funkiest, hottest, party rockin' these Philly kids had ever seen in their lives. That night was crazy. When the party was over, me and Jeff stood out in the driveway catching our breath and cooling off. We were still hyped. Yo, the truck turner echo thing he did was blaze, I said. Your flow sits perfect locked to that chick bass line, Jeff responded. Next time, we'll use the bounce, rock, skate, roll, and then transition to chick word, word. Ideas poured out of us like a fire hose creativity ricocheting back and forth between us. Everything he said set off three ideas in my mind, and my responses had him holding his head and walking around in circles. We never really talked about it, never really made it official, but that wild November night in Judy Stewart's basement, he became my DJ, and I became his rapper. From then on, 
We were DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, just two kids from West Philly, partners, friends, brothers, and we still are today. Over the next couple of months, me and Jeff dug in hard. We practiced every day, performed every weekend. He lived in his mother's basement. It was his sanctuary, his magic workshop. When you entered, it felt like you were getting a sneak peek behind the curtain of the wizard. Jeff was the first friend I'd ever had who plain and simple outworked me. I think it would be a misrepresentation to say that he practiced a lot. It wasn't that he was practicing, it was that he didn't do anything else. You never catch Jeff in the kitchen or watching TV. You wouldn't show up at his house and see him walking up the front steps coming back from the store. He didn't go to the store. I guess wizards don't do their own shopping. Jeff was standing in front of his turntables 14 to 18 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. It's literally the only image I can conjure of Jeff in his childhood home. Jeff was a mad scientist, and he loved technology. He was always waiting for a new gadget to arrive in the mail that you could only get from some 78-year-old guitar builder of questionable history in Vienna. Jeff was moving from solely DJing into beat making and recording. He got a Tascam 4-track recorder, and he was experimenting with creating his own records. He now had a mini studio. Jeff is three years older than me, so he had already graduated, but I had to still go to school and work at the ice house. So by the time I'd get to rehearsal around 4pm, Jeff had already put in 10 hours of work. He'd give me two tracks to write to, I'd show up the next day with one written, and he'd hand me six more tracks. This went on for the first few months of our partnership. DJ Jazzy Jeff was a hip-hop terminator. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep, and he absolutely, positively would not stop until you were dead. I tried to keep up. I would stay as late as I could until mom, mom, or daddy -o would call asking me if I knew what time it was. Those early months in Jeff's basement were among the most creative times I've ever experienced. Everything was cutting edge. Everything was hot. It was experimental and inspiring. I never wanted to leave. We were seeking our sound, but we found ourselves. One night, we were rehearsing in Jeff's basement, and some random dude wearing a Lacoste polo shirt, tan khakis with a razor crease, and Adidas shell toes crawled through the basement window. He calmly went and took a seat in what he clearly thought of as his corner. The music was playing, and Jeff and I were deeply engaged in our artistic banter, so I guess he didn't want to interrupt us. Jeff didn't react to his presence at all. This went on for a few minutes, until I tried to break the awkwardness that obviously only I was feeling. Hey man, you gotta watch wearing those shoes with them pants. If khakis touch shell tops, they could blow your ankles up. I was just trying to break the ice, but the dude looked at me, perceiving a challenge, and said, Oh, is that what we're doing? We bussin'? Because we can get started with those car door ears of yours. Nah, 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 homie, I'm just messing with you. I'm Will. They call me Fresh Prince. Jeff finally popped out of his nutty professor trance and snapped his headphones off. Oh, dang. What up, JL? Jeff said. When did you get here? James Lassiter was Jeff's best friend from childhood. JL grew up one block over on Hazel Avenue. When Jeff was sick as a child, his mother wouldn't allow him to go off his front porch, so JL would come over and sit for hours and hours with Jeff, keeping him company. This routine continued long after Jeff's recovery and well into their adult lives. JL was a serious cat. When I met him, he was putting himself through Temple Law School. He was studying during the day, 
and working at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital at night. He would stop at Jeff's for the last two hours of his day, part habit, part unwind, part front seat to the evolution of the greatest DJ who has ever lived. Our rise in the Philly hip-hop scene was nuclear. We had done every show we could. Block parties, school dances, proms, basement parties, birthdays, fundraisers in church parking lots. You name it, we did it. We had established a rep as fun, creative, captivating party rockers. Eventually, in early 1986, we scored our first real gig at a major venue, the famous Wine Ballroom. Wine was short for Winefield. My hood, my people, with my new DJ. And we smashed it! We were the hottest hip-hop duo in these Philly streets. But our big break came in September 1986, when Jeff was invited to compete in the new music seminar battle for world supremacy. The battle for world supremacy was an old school DJ and MC battle competition held annually in New York City. All of the legends of hip hop had performed and competed in it. Grandmaster Flash, Busy B, Mantronics, Nell Mel, and so on. It was like the Olympics of early 80s hip hop. Local radio DJ Lady B is an iconic pioneer of Philly hip-hop. She was playing rap music before anybody in the city, back when it was only on What Am Radio. She called Dave Funkin Klein, who was one of the event coordinators, and told him that she had found a DJ in Philly who was changing the game. Lady B pressed Funkin Klein to put Jeff in the competition. Even though it was just two hours away by car, the drive felt like a pilgrimage. New York City was the mecca of hip-hop. I had never been to New York. To me, the idea that music could be my passport to new worlds excited and inspired me. Here I was, right now, walking through New York City, headed to the coolest event on the planet, and all because of rap music. The battle was being held in the Grand Ballroom at the Marriott Marcus in Times Square. We rolled up, ten deep, full swag. Red Phillies baseball caps filled the room. We were intimated and in awe, but you couldn't tell it from all the noise we were making. Philly was now officially in the building. Jeff approached the sign-in table. I was standing behind him, arms crossed, chin high, B-boy stance on swole. Mel Mel walks by to my left, entering the ballroom. My B-boy stance got just a little less swole. And then Grandmaster Flash entered right behind him. For comfort, I put my arms by my side. And then I heard a sound over my shoulder. That outburst you hear when old friends haven't seen each other for a while. I vaguely recognized one of the voices where do I know that voice from? And then it hit me. I had never seen him in person before, but I knew it was him. He wasn't rocking a b-boy stance, no flashy clothes, no entourage, but the crowd still parted when he walked through. The undisputed favorite for the MC competition, Grandmaster Kaz. As he passed, it took everything I had not to squeal. I love you, Kaz! Fortunately, he passed quickly, and I didn't play myself, but I'm not sure how much longer I could have held out. Jeff finished signing in, I put my hands in my pockets, and went quietly to find a seat. There were two sections of the battle for world supremacy, the MC competition and the DJ competition. Eight competitors in each, Three elimination rounds, last man standing wins. The battle was set up so that each competitor had three 30 second slots in each round to do their thing. They would go back and forth with their routines, and at the end, the judges would score them, partially based on their techniques and overall performance, but also on the reaction of the crowd. 
The MCs were up first, and it wasn't even a fair fight. Round after round, rapper after rapper fell to the wit and charisma of my idol. Grandmaster Kaz was crowned the world's supreme MC, and I could hold out no longer. I love you, Kaz! The DJs were up next. Back in the day, this was the battle people really came to see. As the newcomer in the first round, Jeff was paired against DJ Cheese, the previous year's champion. Most DJs had worked out two or four routines and repeated them throughout the competition but Jeff had spent the previous week preparing nine separate 30-second routines. He realized that if there were three rounds, each round having three slots, that he would be able to go through the whole tournament without ever repeating a single routine. But he took it even further. Each routine was timed perfectly to end in 30 seconds. So whereas other DJs were looking sloppy, getting cut off by the buzzer, or they had a 20 second intro and never really got their routine started, Jeff's perfectly timed routines had punchlines right at 29 seconds. The effect was that Jeff's buzzer became a signal to the crowd to erupt. The first round is set to begin. Jeff walks across the stage, maybe a little over eager, just a bit too happy to be there, and extends a hand of greeting to DJ Cheese. Cheese looks Jeff up and down and flags him, refused to shake his hand. As Jeff returns to his DJ setup, his cheerful demeanor is gone, and his eyes have turned icy. If Cheese would have known what was coming, he would have just shaken Jeff's hand, or better yet, tried to break it off. Cheese was up first. He came out strong, but Jeff fired back with one of Philly's favorites, a tricky rhythm scratch. People were looking at one another and murmuring, not quite sure what they had just seen. DJ Cheese is eyeballing Jeff, sensing that this is just the beginning. Nobody has ever seen cutting like this. The crowd was inching up onto the edges of their seats. DJ Cheese unleashed his second routine and once again nailed it. The crowd cheers, big scores from all the judges. Then the audience settles down to see what other artillery the Philly kid has brought with him. And with no announcement and no fanfare, Jeff introduces the world to his Transformer Scratch. In 1986, that was the illest thing anybody had ever heard. And that was just the first 10 seconds. He finishes the routine slicing Pump Me Up by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. There's a verse at the end of the song that goes, I'm the bow-legged brother, there'll never be another. I brought a mansion for my mother. Jeff did a breakdown, cutting the last line into syllables. And I bought a mansion for my... And he held it, letting the clock run out. And out of 29 seconds, right before the buzzer, he released the last word, MOTHER. The buzzer sounded, and the crowd lost it. The judges were jumping up out of their seats and walking around with their hands on their heads. Jeff's scratches were so clean, sharp, and calculated that people realized they were witnessing the evolution of the art form. DJ Jazzy Jeff was now serving notice that the road to world supremacy rolled through Philly. Jeff was flawless that night, and when it was all said and done, the 1986 World Supreme DJ was a kid who spent most of his life in a basement in Southwest Philly. My DJ, DJ Jazzy Jeff. Afterward, we all piled into our single room at the Marriott Marquis. We knew something big had just happened. Eric B. and Rakim even came to the room to personally congratulate Jeff. We weren't quite sure where this was all going but we had the sense that some important fuse had just been lit. We stayed up all night, laughing, dreaming, plotting, planning. That night was the first night I realized that the possibilities hip-hop presented me far outstretched anything else I had dared hope for. My whole life, 
My parents' hopes for me had been predicated on education and hard work. I was supposed to go to college. I was supposed to get a good job. I was supposed to move up in the world. And as the self-designated golden child, I had always committed to living up to my parents' hopes and dreams. I couldn't imagine it otherwise. But by the time we drove home the next morning, New York disappearing behind us, I was struck with an overwhelming conviction. I am not going to college. Dana Goodman had cash. He was about 5'6 and heavy set. Not fat, but thick in a way that he could hurt you if he had to. Approaching 40, he was a Winefield old head. When you would see him standing on the corner, it was only briefly, because he was above those fools. He was doing real <laughs> Dana was the little brother of Lawrence Goodman, founder of Pop Art Records, one of the first New York-based hip-hop labels. Lawrence was from Philly, but he was killing him in NYC. Those first few months back in Philly, me and Jeff were on fire. Jeff was now spending 80% of his time making records and 20% DJing. We had finished six or seven songs on Jeff's Tascam 4-track. He had mixed them as best he could, but Jeff was becoming increasingly frustrated that his equipment couldn't quite reproduce the sounds that were trapped in his head. I had recently purchased a Sharp 777, the original hip-hop boombox. It was one of the first times I noticed a major corporation responding to the demands of our burgeoning art form. The 777 was a loud, heavy, radio. You had to be strong to carry that thing around, and you had to carry it, because for some reason, if you sat it on the ground, it drained your expensive 10D batteries way faster. Best of all, the 777 had dual, high-speed cassette replication capabilities, so I would take the cassettes that me and Jeff made home with me, and I would stay up all night high-speed dubbing our demos. This was the old days where you had to do one tape at a time. It was dull and monotonous, you know? Like building a brick wall when you're f***ing <coughs> nine! But it needed to be done, so I did it. I then handed those tapes out to everybody. I didn't care if you even knew what hip-hop was. If you got two ears and a tape deck, then my name's The Fresh Prince. It says it right here on my pants. And I've got a tape you gotta hear. Overbrook High was situated in Hilltop, and Hilltop was run by about 30 dudes who called themselves the Hilltop Hustlers. One of the top rappers in that crew was Steady B, instead was Lawrence Goodman's nephew. The word in the street was that his uncle had just given him a deal, and he had music coming out later that year. I wanted Stead to get my tape to Lawrence. The problem was, I was from across the bridge in Winefield, and if there was one thing that a hilltop hustler would never do, it's help a <coughs> from Winefield. But then it hit me. Dana Goodman lives in Winefield. Maybe he'll pass our tape to Lawrence. Dana and Lawrence, like many brothers, had a bit of a sibling rivalry going on. Dana saw the money his brother was making with his record label, and he hoped to start a label of his own. He called up me and Jeff and said he wanted to meet, so we invited him over to Jeff's to hear us perform. Dana was wearing a dark blue velour Sergio Tacchini sweatsuit, the one with the red and white elasticated wrist and ankle bands. The sweatsuit was zipped open just low enough to reveal his seven or eight slim gold chains bouncing off the afro on his chest. He was that older dude who almost got away with dressing like the kids, except he had dress socks on. Dana always wore sunglasses, indoors, outdoors, noon, midnight, basketball court, church. You never caught Dana not rocking his shades. That day, Dana pulled up in front of Jeff's house in a brand new four-door steel blue Audi 4000 CS Quattro 5-speed, and for the first time in my life, I saw a phone in a car. 
It was the first car phone ever. It was a rotary dial house phone that somehow worked in his car. Dana stepped out on Rodman Street. He was a boss. He was loud. He was a showman. And the sun was banging off his pinky ring. Me and Jeff were standing on his mom's porch. Dana saw us, threw his arms wide open, and in his low, weathered, baritone voice, yelled out to the kids playing and the neighbors passing, Yo! There they go, pointing to me and Jeff. That's them, y'all. You better get the autographs now. That's DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Them boys about to do something. He called me and Jeff down. Come here, y'all. Give me some love. Me and Jeff stepped down to the sidewalk, and Dana hugged us like a proud father. Look what y'all did up in New York, holding it down for Philly. Me and Jeff smiled. Well, you know, that's what we do, I said. Just then, one of Jeff's neighbors, a dude a few years older named Keith, called out, Hey, Dana, that you, man? Oh, it's Dana Goodman. What you slumming, man? Keith and Dana shook hands, one of those long, elaborate handshakes with multiple steps from a previous generation, which also didn't go with Dana's sweatsuit. What brings you around these parts? Keith asked. Oh, you know, I'm here to talk to these boys about a little business, Dana said. Business? Keith looked at me and Jeff. His energy shifted slightly, but our youth and our excitement blinded us to the subtleties. Keith pulled Dana aside, put his arm around him. You know this is Jimmy Town's little brother, right? Dana looked over at Jeff. Jimmy Town's brother? Keith got up real close to Dana and whispered something in his ear that we couldn't hear. Dana looked down, then started nodding. Yeah, yeah, I got you, man. This is just business. I'm trying to help them. Family, Keith said, loud enough for us to hear this time. He then said his goodbyes and went down the street. Dana came down to the basement. Me and Jeff let him hear everything we had. Dana picked the two songs he liked the most. The first was called Just One of Those Days. Just One of Those Days featured a slow, 92 BPM groove where I rapped about having one of those days where everything goes wrong. For the chorus, Jeff sampled Irving Berlin's Putting on the Ritz, a 1928 ragtime joint that was the first song ever performed in a film by an interracial ensemble. It was pure jazzy Jeff, mixing old-time highbrow music with the scratches and rhythms of hip-hop. It crystallized our musical dynamic. Jeff's musical sophistication and in-depth knowledge married to my natural storytelling and humor. The second song was Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, the one inspired by Grandmaster Kaz's Yvette. This time, Jeff sampled the theme song from the famous 1980s sitcom I Dream of Genie. He used the brand new Roland 909 drum machine and he detuned the toms to make them sound like a bass line. I told the story of the night in Judy Stewart's basement where my exquisite lovemaking almost got me frostbitten. Dana loved it. He was cracking up. Yo, did that really happen? Tell the truth. That happened for real? Yeah, man, I said. That was a rough night. He burst out laughing. Boy, y'all some talented funny, is, he said. Hip-hop has evolved so much over the decades that listening to those songs now, I cringe. They sound so simplistic and repetitive. But back then, what we were doing was revolutionary. Jeff and I played with the structure of songs in a way that no one else in hip-hop had up until that point. We had lyricless choruses, we had verses that were half samples, half raps. I was building verses that constructed a full story, each verse leading into the next, begging the listener to finish the song to find out what happened by the end. It was a new day, dare I say, 
it was fresh. Dana was bopping his head to the beat, clapping his hands, stomping, and then finally, playing as if he couldn't take it anymore, he said, that's enough, that's enough, turn it off. Jeff hit the stop button on the 4-track. If we had been in a cartoon, Dana would have had spinning dollar signs in his eyes. But in real life, he thumbed the gold chains on his chest and said, Oh man, what y'all say we make a record? Me and Jeff snapped. We were hyped. Jumping, high-fiving, yelling. We were so naive. We thought that was it. You just invite a guy to your house, and he says, let's make a record, and boom, you're a star. We didn't realize that Dana didn't even have a company yet. He had no distribution, very few connections in radio or television, and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were his first foray into the music business. A week later, we walked into Studio 4, a professional recording studio that Dana found in downtown Philly. It's hard to describe what Jeff's face looked like when he entered the main control room. It was as if he were a 17-year-old virgin walking onto the set of a porno movie and finding out that he was the star. Dana presented us with a recording contract, and we signed it. We had never been in a real recording studio before, so we weren't really sure what to do or how it worked. Dana had at least been in with his brother on many of the pop art hits. He had ideas of how it should be and what he wanted to hear. The contract dictated that Dana was the producer and co-songwriter of our music. He started telling Jeff to change tempos, to shift pitches, to add cuts and adjust sounds. Jeff disagreed with many of Dana's creative choices, but in Dana's mind, since he paid for the studio time, he was in charge. Jeff was fuming, but this was our big shot, our one chance, so we didn't want to mess it up. Just one of those days got mangled in that recording session. The tempos between the verse and chorus were different. The song inexplicably changed keys. The mix was awful. Jeff still hates that track, even though we re-recorded it later. But Girls got through the recording sessions mostly unscathed and still held up as a song. Despite Jeff's grumblings, it was decided that Girls would be our first release as a single, and Just One of Those Days would be the B-side. We'd release them to build up some hype while we recorded our first full album. The Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble single came out in March 1986, although nobody knew it, because it was on Dana's new record label, Word Up Records. No offices, no employees, no distribution. The single wasn't even in stores. Dana was selling the vinyl out of the trunk of his car. Nothing was happening. To his credit, he was doing everything he knew how to do. He was a hustler. He spent his own money, and he absolutely believed in DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Even though nobody knew we had a record out, Jeff's win at the battle for world supremacy meant that promoters started calling to put him on shows, and I came as a part of the package deal. We started hitting the nicer clubs around Philly. We played Delaware and Atlantic City. The shows were getting big enough that there were contracts and on one occasion, we needed to sign and fax one back by 5 p.m. the same day or we'd lose the gig. Jeff and I were scrambling. Who the <coughs> do we know with a fax machine? JL was sitting in JL's corner of Jeff's basement, in his own world, reading the back of an Ohio Players album cover, the one with the naked girl on the inside with the honey all over her. Jeff and I were getting more and more frantic, trying to prevent this $1,500 from evaporating as 5 p.m. approached. Neither of us had a fax machine. I figured Mom might have access to one at work, but it was already late on Friday. Daddy-o didn't like that newfangled 
and Word Up Records only had a rotary dial car phone in its mobile business office. JL sat there quietly as Jeff and I became aggravated with each other. You got all of this computer down here, but you don't have a damn fax machine, I said. You could get a sampling guitar pedal from a Nazi in Vienna, and you don't have no way of faxing a damn contract? How is it my job? What do you do in the group? JL never looked up, and in a bored monotone voice, he said, as much to the Ohio player girl as to me and Jeff, I have a fax machine. And that's how James Lasseter became our manager. There's a great concept from Jim Ron. Look at the five people you spend the most time with because that's who you are. This is an idea I've always understood innately. Deep down inside, I knew that my dreams would be made or broken by the people I chose to surround myself with. Confucius had it right. It's nearly impossible for the quality of your life to be higher than the quality of your friends. And by the grace of God, there has never been a single moment of my life where I have looked to my left or to my right and not seen an extraordinary friend, someone who believed in me and was down for whatever. JL was in his final year of law school, and while it may have been a casual act of convenience for Jeff and me to hire him as our manager, we quickly realized that JL was not a casual kind of guy. He started making contact with all of our venues and concert promoters and began requesting documentation and financial information about record sales and studio costs from Dana. And when he wasn't satisfied with the responses, he hired a New York City attorney to oversee all of our business dealings. JL was one of those guys who didn't care about fame or money. He wasn't flashy, and he didn't want fancy clothes or sparkly jewels. He prided himself simply on defending the people he loved. JL read the recording contract we had signed with Dana. He had highlighted and circled and X'd out clauses which didn't really matter because we had already signed it. Perched in JL's corner with a perplexed look on his face, he asked, Did you two read this contract? Jeff and I kind of glanced at each other. I didn't read it, did you? I said. Jeff shook his head, and then to JL said, Nah, what does it say? That was not the answer JL was hoping for. It says that y'all are stupid. Dana was always upbeat, telling us how hard he was working and how much money he was spending to promote the record. Jeff had heard it a couple of times on what around midnight, and a few friends and family members had caught it, but it was getting spotty airplay at best. You gotta bribe radio stations. You gotta wine and dine people. You know, it's competitive. They be trying to john me up. They play in it though. Y'all just not catching it. Just give me some time. Y'all gonna be huge. Since I had secretly decided that I wasn't going to college, I stopped doing homework, I didn't study for tests, and I didn't even show up for a lot of my classes. As far as Daddy-O was concerned, if I was disciplined at the ice house, performed my tasks impeccably, and wasn't getting myself arrested or killed, he was cool. But Mom Mom was friends with all of my teachers at Overbrook, and she snapped. Mom Mom's super most parenting mission was for me and for all of her children to go to college. For her, college was everything. It was what she had picked up and moved to Philly for. It was why she tolerated Daddy O's drinking and violence. It was a big part of why she moved back to Woodcrest. To her, a college education was the fundamental bedrock of a successful life, and without it, I was doomed. Hope sustains life. Hope is the elixir of survival during our darkest times. The ability to envision and imagine a brighter day gives meaning to our suffering and renders it bearable. 
When we lose hope, we lose our central source of strength and resilience. My mother's hope for her kids had sustained her through the darkest years of her marriage, but now I had developed hopes of my own. I had hip-hop hopes. I had hopes for albums and being on stage in front of 50,000 people shouting, Who? when I told him to. These hopes were now empowering and sustaining me. I would have died if I had to give them up. I couldn't. I wouldn't. It came to a head one afternoon toward the end of my senior year. I hadn't come home after school. I had gone straight to Jeff's to rehearse. It was about 10 p.m. when I finally made it home. I could feel Mom Mom before I even put my key in the front door. Sure enough, Mom Mom was in the kitchen waiting for me. Hey, Mom, I said, mock joyfully. Are you having a problem? She said evenly. Nah, I'm good, Ma. No, apparently you're having a big problem. Or at least you're about to. What's up, Mom? What happened? I just talked to Mrs. Stubbs. After four years, you've forgotten where your classes are? No, Mom. I'm just doing a lot of stuff. What are you doing that's more important than getting into college? You know these schools are going to look at your final senior grades. We have come too far for you to throw your life away now. What is your problem? Mom Mom's voice and her posture denoted anger, but I saw something else beneath that. She was terrified. My heart melted. Mom, I've been working with Jeff for almost a year. People say he's the best DJ in the world. Rap is blowing up. It's on the radio, it's on MTV, and Run DMC went to Japan. I'm telling you, Mom, we are making songs that are as good as what anybody else is doing. Every time we perform, people go crazy. We found a record producer who's putting up money. We have a manager. Nobody in Philly can rap as good as me. Everybody says we're going to be stars. I just need some time to make it happen. No, you can't be a rapper, she said bluntly. What? Why not? Because I don't know what that is. You listen to me right now. You will not cut another class. You will not miss another test. You will complete every single piece of homework that is assigned to you. You are going to college in the fall, period. Mom, just listen to the music. I've been hearing you hippity hopping around here your whole life. That is a hobby. That is not a career. Good night. She stood up from the kitchen table, turned to walk away, and I stopped her with probably the worst thing I ever said to my mother. Mom, I'm not going to college. I was here on the backs of generations who had struggled through hardship and sacrifice. The blessed recipient in a long lineage of striving African Americans to have a stable, educated, middle-class life in America. My mom and daddy-o's generation grew up in the throes of segregation and immense poverty. Gigi's family had escaped the Jim Crow South. My mother had fought through decades of school district bureaucracies, financial uncertainty, and daddy-o's bull <coughs> to get me to this point. And she was going to be damned if I didn't go to college because of some music I was doing at basement parties with homeboys named Jazz and ready rock. Our hopes had finally collided, and these hopes were inherently incompatible with each other. One had to go away. One of us was going to have our heart broken. The thing I've learned over the years about advice is that no one can accurately predict the future, but we all think we can. So advice, at its best, is one person's limited perspective of the infinite possibilities before you. People's advice is based on their fears, their experiences, their prejudices, and at the end of the day, their advice is just that. It's theirs, not yours. When people give you advice, 
They're basing it on what they would do, what they can perceive, on what they think you can do. But the bottom line is, while yes, it is true that we are all subject to a series of universal laws, patterns, tides, and currents, all of which are somewhat predictable, you are the first time you've ever happened. You and now are a unique occurrence of which you are the most reliable measure of all the possibilities. I've always loved the scene in The Pursuit of Happiness on the Baseball Court in which Jaden's character shoots the ball and yells, I'm going pro! My character, Chris Gardner, discourages him from pursuing basketball but catches himself. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. You gotta dream. You gotta protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. If you want something, go get it. Period. My mother's college education saved her life, which solidified for her a fundamental premise. A college education is the only armor against the brutality of this world. And without a college education, I would be condemned to certain destruction. This was not her advice to me. This was the truth. To her, being a rapper was impossible. But I am not my mother. Just as her education saved and defended her from the hardships of her early life, performance and hip-hop had saved me from mine. It's clearer when I look back now. While we were gridlocked and colliding and arguing, the reality was both things were true. One was true for her, and the other was true for me. But at the time, neither of us could compromise because it would mean destroying everything we stood for. daddy was caught in the middle. Mom-Mom was demanding that he make me go to college, and I was begging him to please understand what I was saying. It was clear that he was going to have the final word. daddy was going to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner of the hopes and dreams of either his wife or his son. daddy deliberated for about a week. He would take me for a drive, Mom-Mom for a walk. He'd ask questions and listen to us talk. In the meantime, Woodcrest was as cold as the ice house. My mother and I were cordial. We kept it on high and by. And then one evening, daddy called us both into the kitchen. My mother and I sat at the table, and daddy leaned against the stove. daddy had been here before, except the last time he was sitting in my seat, when he was being told by his parents what he could and couldn't do, when he had so loved his camera, but he'd been told it was just a hobby, not a career. At his heart, daddy was an artist who had been robbed of his dreams and his passions because they were unrealistic and impractical. But he also knew firsthand the viciousness of this world against an uneducated black kid. Everything daddy ever did, somebody had told him he couldn't do it. He was supposed to get a job because there was no way he could start his own business. People told him there was no way white people would work for him. There was no way real supermarkets would buy ice from a black man. He lived against a ferocious headwind of doubt and discouragement, but he did it all anyway. So here's what we're gonna do, daddy said. You got one year. Your mother said she can get all them schools to hold your acceptance till next September. We're gonna help you and support you to do anything you think you need to do to succeed. But in one year, if it ain't happening, you're going to go to whichever one of them schools your mother chose. That work for you? In my mind, a year was forever. I was ecstatic. He turned to Mom Mom. That work for you? Mom Mom clearly didn't love it but this was a compromise that kept her dreams alive. She only said one word. Yep. And with that, daddy went back to work. My experiences with my father are a mixed bag, to say the least. But that night, 
in the kitchen at 5943 Woodcrest Avenue, he displayed the most exquisite leadership I had ever seen. That was how a father was supposed to be. A few weeks later, my mother called the dean at the University of Wisconsin, a school where my application had been accepted. She told the dean everything. It's terrible, she said. My son wants to take a gap year. He's doing something called rapping. He's got a manager and some company is paying him to record an album. It all sounds suspect to me, but we were wondering if you could hold his place till September 87. The Dean listened patiently. I think that's incredible, Mrs. Smith. What? Ma Mom said. For a young man his age, he would never get that kind of life experience here. He should absolutely do it. My mother was floored, and certainly will hold a spot for him. If his album doesn't work out, he can attend next year. That's no problem. A few weeks later, in early May, about a month before my graduation, I was bagging ice at ACRAC. In case you were wondering, bagging ice is just as dull and monotonous as it sounds, and you always hurt your back. The aluminum scoop held about four pounds of ice. Two and a half scoops into a ten pound bag, which you would then spin to twist the top and then drop it into the time machine and then toss the bag into the shopping cart. If you stacked them correctly, you could get about 24 bags into one shopping cart. Then you roll the cart into the freezer, take the bags out one at a time, and stack them. In a four hour session, one person could do 200 to 250 bags. It's repetitive and you just kind of zone out for a few hours while you do it. I always liked to do it at night, because that's when Power 99 played hip hop. I'd listen to the Power 9 at 9 countdown, getting lost in my own world and staying up on the new hip hop johns. I would rap along, memorizing my favorite songs, and shovel on beat, inventing my own rhymes. But that night, I was quiet. For the first time, I understood the old saying, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. I had held my ground against my parents, and they gave in but now I had to prove it. Number five, 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 five. We got Cool Mo D's brand new track, Go See the Doctor. I was walking down the street, rocking my beat, clapping my hands and stopping my feet. I saw a little lady so neat and petite. She was so sweet, yes, I wanted to meet. I mean, I'm as good as Cool Mo D, I thought trying to psych myself up, but Mom Mom had gotten into my head. What if she's right? What if a rapper isn't really a thing? And only one year? Is that enough? This last year just blazed on by. Maybe I should go to college. I did do all of this with Jeff while I went to high school. Maybe I could go to college and still do music. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. Scoop bag. I am not trying to be living at home. I need my own spot, my own money, my own car. Number four! The Beastie Boys are back with Hold It Now, Hit It. Now I chill real ill when I start to chill, when I fill my pockets with a knot of dollar bills, sipping pints of ale out of the window sill. When I get my fill, I'm chilly chill. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. Man, I'm definitely as good as the Beastie Boys, except they're on the radio and I'm bagging ice. Maybe bagging ice is my destiny, but man, if I'm stuck here with Daddy-O in 10 years, I'ma sever my own head with the dull end of this ice scoop. I mean, Run DMC and Beastie Boys had to have their own versions of bagging ice, right? Or maybe they were flukes. One in a million. Number, number, number three. Check it out, y'all. Hot off the presses from Set Satonic's debut album, On Fire. This is a new one. You guys been asking for it. It's called My Rhyme. But I'm one in a million. 
Jeff's one in a million. My mom is not my target audience. How she thinks she's going to tell if a rapper is good or not? She judging stuff she doesn't even understand. And what about Melanie? You cannot keep a girlfriend if you're running off to some college somewhere. She'll be tossed up with some other joker in two weeks. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. And we're back with number two. It's your boy's old favorite. That's right. Run DMC. My Adidas. This was my jam. It snapped me out of my funk. I was back to shoveling on beat and rapping along. My Adidas walk through concert doors and roam all over Coliseum floors. I stepped on stage at Live Aid. All the people gave and the poor got paid. My shoveling picked up pace completely involuntarily. That's the power of hip hop, I thought. My ideas touched the sand of a foreign land. With mic in hand, I cold took command. But my reverie was short lived. I couldn't get my mind off Mom Mom. I'd failed to protect her from Daddy O. I wasn't brave enough to go with her when she left, and now the hopes she had for me, the dreams that had sustained her through all her pain and trouble, I was spitting in the face of that. I couldn't shake the sense that I was failing her again. My Adidas finished playing, and Power 99 went to a commercial break. I realized I had missed the end of the song. Damn, I thought. Not even my Adidas could pull me out of this one. I rolled the final cart into the freezer. I was done for the night. I counted the bags while commercials blared. New mattress sales. Everything must go. Maybe I could sell mattresses, I thought. That can't be hard. I could do hip-hop mattress wraps. Get a good night's rest, good sleep routines. Got twins and fulls, got kings and queens. I threw the shovel on the side, closed the machines up. And we're back with the Power 9 at 9 countdown. Tonight we have a newcomer to the countdown. Shutting off the lights, I realized I couldn't find my keys. I'd lost my keys a few times before, and Daddy O had to come pick me up. I was dreading the thought of having to call him to come get me. Here I am, demanding my independence, about to have to call my daddy to pick me up because I can't find my dang keys. The phones had been off the hook all day from y'all wanting to hear these guys, so get ready for our hometown boys, Philly's very own DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. This is Girls Ain't Nothing But... I totally froze. My mouth was hanging open. For some reason, my heart was pounding. I wanted to scream. I wanted to jump. But at the same time, I didn't want to do anything to bump into the universe and knock my record off the radio. Then those words. Those words I knew so well and had repeated hundreds, maybe thousands of times before, were coming out of the radio. Listen, homeboys, don't mean to burst your bubble, but girls of the world ain't nothing but trouble. It was my voice. That was me on the radio. Me. My rhymes. My voice. I wanted to call people, but I didn't want to miss it. Just last week when I was walking down the street, I observed this lovely lady that I wanted to meet. I ran outside. I wanted to grab somebody to tell somebody, that's me, y'all. That's me. But it was 10 o'clock. Nobody was out there. I started giggling. A knee-jerk reaction that I still have to this day when I find myself in extreme emotional circumstances. I couldn't stop laughing. It was a joyous, blissful laughter. The pure joy of a child waking up on Christmas morning. The joy of discovery. Of renewed hope. Of a new life the joy of being right about me.